title of this presentation is Optimizing Therapy. And even though this is uh, an echo workshop, we don't have uh, a lot of information on optimizing therapy from ECHO guidelines because the methodology of ECHO guidelines is very strict and the guidelines only have information from RCTs, really high level scientific information. So I have today some data that supports what I'm currently doing in my clinical practice. And one concept that I would like to start today is that optimizing therapy goes far beyond drug intensification. It's not only about drug intensification. Optimize the optimizing therapy means that we will put together all that, those strategies that we have to improve patients' outcomes. And here are some of these strategies. Treat smarter, predict who will have aggressive disease so, stratify your patients according to predictive factors of uh, bad behavior in the baseline. So, you can offer effective therapy earlier to those high-risk patients. Also, treat deeper, aiming for endoscopic healing. By now, our ultimate goal for UC and CD is endoscopic healing. So treat to target and closely monitor your patient. This is tight control. But as this is a case-based discussion, I will start with a patient, uh, a 24-year-old male patient with a three-year history of UC. Uh, he has been treated with infliximab standard dose every eight weeks and azathioprine 2.5 milligrams per kilo every um, since 2.5 years and he complains that after the last three infusions he notes some blood on his stools around week six which resolves after infusion of infliximab. His fecal calprotectin is over 600 and his infliximab levels is around three and we can see here in his sigmoidoscopy some erosions a male 2 score. So anti-TNF has revolutionized the treatment of IBD, but we still have high rates of primary non-response from most of the trials and also secondary loss of response. And why do patients fail to biologics? Until uh, up to one third of patients will have primary non-response. And although most of the time we have the concept that primary non-response is related to the mechanism of failure, uh, I would like to really emph emphasize this message here. There is pharmacokinetic failure during primary non-response. There is a cause of primary non-response. So we should optimize our, our patients earlier. Uh, 30 to 50% of patients will have secondary loss of response and the remaining patients will have intolerance or adverse events. So how would you approach this patient? Please raise your hand if you would dose optimize by decreasing the interval. Uh, who would dose optimize by increasing the dose? and switch to another anti-TNF. I thought that you would do switch to another mechanism of action. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I already know you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And you... who would switch to another mechanism of action? Oh, you, 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 don't, you are not so certain today. Uh, so I uh, decreased the interval of infliximab to every six weeks. And what's the clinical utility of measuring infliximab trough levels and antibodies? If uh, we have, uh, in, in, we are in the situation that the patient presents secondary loss of response. Uh, this is the situation, the 
the optimal scenario to perform reactive testing. And why should we do this? Because in this situation, if we have sub-therapeutic level, uh, if we increase infliximab, we will recapture response in almost 90% of the case. On the other hand, if we have detectable antibodies, if we increase the dose, this is not a good idea. This will not result in recapture of response. So that's uh, how this algorithm, I don't know, uh, this is very known in Brazil. I don't know if you are used to, to this algorithm, but those information uh, supported this algorithm. That's the algorithm of reactive in testing. So when you have secondary loss of response and you measure levels and antibody, you will have four different situations. In half of the time, you will have subtherapeutic level and undetectable antibodies. And this is the so-called non-immune mediated pharm pharmacokinetic failure. In this situation, uh, the approach, the recommended approach is dose intensification. But if you have detectable antibodies, we, we are in front of immune mediated pharmacokinetic failure and the algorithm says that we should switch in class with immunomodulators. But this is some caveat because uh, I have some colleagues, including my friend here, Manu, who would advocate in this situation to switch out of class because of the risk of immunogenicity to a second anti-TNF when you have immunogenicity to the first one. But also we have some data supporting that in case that you have detectable antibodies but no high levels of antibodies, you can keep your treatment and you can overcome this, this immunogenicity by optimizing your treatment, even by adding, either by adding immunomodulator or increasing the dose. But if you have therapeutic trough level, it doesn't really matter if you have detectable or undetectable antibodies because these antibodies probably are non-neutralizing. And here we are in front of mechanistic failure. And there's another caveat here because uh, in the recent consensus, expert consensus statement, authors say uh, that we should consider mechanistic failure in supra-therapeutic levels around 10 to 15 of infliximab and dadalimumab to say that is mechanistic failure. Uh, so they say that we should push the levels before considering mechanistic failure. And what about increasing the dose or decreasing the interval? If we go to the literature, there's no, uh, there's no much difference between the two strategies. What I do in my clinical practice is this, is if a patient, when received, immediately after receiving the infusion, uh, reports a suboptimal sub improvement, then I would increase the dose. But if he gets better and after next to the next infusion, he stays with some symptoms, then I would uh, decrease the interval. Who should, uh, should you repeat infliximab concentration and antibodies? Who would repeat? No one? You don't have, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> it's not so easy for us, but tomorrow we will have a, a lecture about the utility of TDM and I will share with you how we could get this in Brazil. But there is data supporting that if we have reactive testing, we should do proactive testing following reactive testing. And this really improves outcomes, IBD-related hospitalization and treatment failure. And what are the optimal drug concentrations? Uh, this is not the holy grail. I do not... Uh, consider just 
these values to, to make my decisions in clinical practice, but I do take in account these values along with other monitorization markers such as fecal calprotectin to make my decisions on my patients. But usually during uh, the maintenance phase, I aim for around 10 for infliximab, 10 to 12 for adalimumab, and uh, I consider re a mechanistic failure when it's 10 to 15 for infliximab and adalimumab. And why should we care about levels? Why levels are so important? Because there are a lot of factors uh, affecting the pharmacokinetic profile of the drugs. So I don't think it's really rational if we give a standard and fixed dose of a drug with such, such interference in uh, its pharmacokinetic profile. So in that patients that are really inflamed with high TNF circulating levels, with high CRP, with decreased albumin, which is also a sign that there's leak through the intestine. And we can see here in the right side of the slide that patients do lose infliximab into feces. We uh, just talked about this before. Uh, so I think we should really individualize our treatment and take care about induction in patients that are really inflamed because there's a risk of increased clearance. And coming back to our case, I repeated infliximab that was around 10 at six weeks because infliximab is always in the trough. For adalimumab, it doesn't really matter because the dose is really stable after induction. But for infliximab, we have the peak and we have the trough and we should always measure it in the trough immediately before the next infusion. And repeated sigmoidoscopy demonstrates mucosal healing and he maintains adequate infliximab trough checked once a year. And it is monotherapy. And how can we optimize response to anti-TNF anti -TNF having said that? I have here some uh, reflections on how should we do this. Uh, the first thing is regarding the induction. So this is the demonstration that the demonstration that we do have pharmacokinetic failure during induction. We can see here in the left side of the slide that patients with primary non-response to infliximab achieved lower levels at week two and week six. So probably we could optimize our treatment, we could recapture some response if we give more drugs to those patients who really need. And also in the right side, some data from Boston showing that we do have better outcomes, uh, higher rates of short-term mucosal healing in those patients achieving higher levels early on, week two and week six. Also, uh, in the most interesting study is PAINTS study, which is a huge observational cohort that included over 1,600 patients from the UK. And the aim of this study was to uh, elucidate which were the factors associated with primary non-response and um, loss of response. And the only factor that was really associated with non-remission by the end of one year was the level at week 14. And here we have the data from primary non-response. And we can see that low drug concentrations at week 14 was associated with primary non-response. And the optimal week 14 drug concentrations for infliximab is around 7 and for adalimumab around 12. I like to check levels on week 6 because if we do, uh, if we have levels only on week 
for Qin. I think it's, it's not, uh, we already missed our golden hour to do something. I think we need to do something before week 14. And also here data uh, from, from non-response at week 54, and we can see that the same, the same cutoff was, uh, was found for the identification of patients with non-response uh, non at week 54. <laughs> So, in my opinion, we should start TDM during and early after induction. And this is not only my opinion. Uh, we have this review where, pay, where authors emphasize in what are the potential benefits of TDM during induction. Uh, so, uh, probably we could improve our clinical outcomes. We could improve our quality of life because of more rapid attaining of remission, less corticoid exposure. We could have some pharmacoeconomic benefits because if you optimize your treatment, but why? Mm -hmm. TDM is, is, is not cost effective. We are using more drug, but if you attain remission more rapid, probably you have an increased chance to de-escalate your treatment later on. And also we can have some pharmacokinetic benefits. Uh, so the, the first thing that I do to optimize treatment is to check levels early on and optimize my treatment uh, around week 14. The second is regarding uh, adding an immunomodulator to anti-TNF. The best evidence that we have for combination therapy comes from SONIC trial, which is a um, milestone in, in the IBD trials, which demonstrated a higher rate of remission, corticoid-free remission, among patients treated with infliximab plus azathioprine. But almost eight years later, this post hoc analysis comes with a very unique concept. Uh, in fact, in the groups with higher infliximab concentrations quartiles, we can see a greater proportion of patients under combo therapy. But when we analyze the rates of corticoid-free remission, uh, this analysis suggests that it's drug concentrations and not combination therapy that is associated with better outcomes. So probably if we achieve the levels we don't really need azathioprine. Uh, I know that we don't have many RCTs that prove that proactive TDM is good, but uh, tomorrow I will show one. But uh, I, I always remember that it's really hard to demonstrate superiority of proactive TDM because it's a treatment strategy. So if you do a, an RCT, you will randomize to both arms that will be treated. Patients will be treated in both arms. So you would need a really huge sample size to really demonstrate a difference. But we have here some, uh, some data demonstrated, uh, demonstrating that proactive TDM can result in better outcomes and uh, lower, less discontinuation of treatment than standard of care. Uh, so this is all I have to do about optimizing treatment against anti-TNF. But what about other biologics? I don't know if you were here yesterday, but Professor Manu have shown this slide yesterday. yesterday. Yes. <laughs> where uh, we have data from vedolizumab, pivotal data showing that uh, we don't have higher rates of loss of response over time. The response is really stable over time, but when it comes to real life studies, we have a difference, especially for Crohn's disease. But we must remember that when vedolizumab was launched, the first patients who were offered the treatment were the most refractory patients. 
And then uh, probably this is why the laws of response is really different from the pivotal trials. Uh, and the good news is that patients do re recapture response when they have, uh, when they are dose intensified in almost 50% of the case. And this more recently publicated systematic review with meta-analysis shows that we can recapture response in real life studies in about 50% of patients. And what about ustekinumab? For ustekinumab, I think the response is even more uh, stable over time. We have data here and show 92 weeks showing that it's really flat. We don't have loss of response over time. Uh, in real life, it's a different story, probably due to the same reasons when ustekinumab was launched Patients who were offered treatment were those more refractory. But we have several publications analyzing different dose optimization strategies. And here we can see a miscellaneous of many different strategies. We have the mixed strategies with uh, reinduction plus optimization. We have intens intensification to every four weeks, every two weeks, every six weeks. We have some studies assessing IV reinduction, IV maintenance, and also early optimization. And I will show you some of this data. First of, one, first of uh, them is this study that Professor Manu was also involved, uh, where 142 patients were enrolled, and look at that. 97% of patients had previous exposure to other biologics. And the regimen were mixed, 25% were offered reinduction, 75% were intensified to ever four weeks or both. Interestingly, importantly, no new safety signs here. It's safe to optimize our treatment, and we could recapture response in around 50% of the cases, and 68% of patients continued treatment at the last visit. This is another study assessing uh, one intensification strategy, but this study is really interesting because it only enrolled very severe patients. So only patients with Crohn's disease that were refractory and that were um, with severe activity at baseline were enrolled. And patients who were randomized to either receive early optimization with uh, ustekinumab, SUBQ, every four weeks just after the induction or ustekinumab standard dose. And the primary endpoint of clinical and biological remission was met uh, for the population, 35% of the patients achieved this outcome, but no difference was, no difference was seen for endoscopic improvement. And this is another study which included patients who were under maintenance treatment with ustekinumab, but they had loss of response, and the patients were randomized to either keep their treatment with subcutaneous uh, ustekinumab or uh, randomized to receive an IV induction. And the primary endpoint was assessed at week 16, that was the proportion of patients achieving clinical response. And we could see this uh, endpoint in almost 50% of patients in the IV arm. This is one of the secondary endpoints that was fecal calprotectin and or CRP normalization, which was also uh, met, this endpoint. And all of the secondary endoscopic endpoints were better in patients who went the IV arm. So probably the IV reinduction is an option for these patients. 
It's all that I have, and I have some take-home messages here uh, that are a strongly and consistent positive association between trough levels and clinical outcomes, and this will help, help us in guiding our decisions. For anti-TNF, reactive TDM is more appropriate than empiric dose escalation, and this is cost-effective. This has been demonstrated that this strategy is cost-effective. Uh, proactive TDM following reactive TDM improves outcomes. Proactive TDM during induction may provide potential benefits, as I've shown you. And optimized monotherapy may be an alternative to combination therapy. I'm starting to use this a lot, but only in patients that do not have perianal disease. And if I can have proactive TDM. Without proactive TDM, I do not offer infliximab monotherapy. For vedolizumab, those escalation to every four weeks can improve outcomes in approximately 15% of the patients. And ustekinumab, both IV reinduction and decreased interval are acceptable strategies. Thank you very much.